Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday Online from St. John's Vicarage. It's very good to have you worshipping with me today. Last Sunday was Mothering Sunday and we had our Mothering Sunday tea in the afternoon. And I'm just going to show you a couple of photos that I thought you might like. One is all the yummy cakes. Thank you so much to those of you who cooked for us. And then that was one of the families that came, four generations of them. And they all had a great time. So thank you to everyone who made that possible. Today is the fifth Sunday of Lent and it's lovely to have Anthony as our preacher this morning. Let's be quiet for a moment now as we prepare to worship. O oh Lord, open our lips and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Hear our voice, O oh Lord, according to your faithful love. According to your judgment, give us life. Blessed are you, God of compassion and mercy. To you be praise and glory forever. In the darkness of our sin, your light breaks forth like the dawn and your healing springs up for deliverance. As we rejoice in the gift of your saving help, sustain us with your bountiful spirit and open our lips to sing your praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. So let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading today is read by Sylvia and then Anthony will read the gospel and open God's word to us. A reading from St Paul's letter to the Philippians. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of, of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this, or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Let's start with our Gospel passage from John. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one that was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? 
He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Lord. As we look at this passage this morning, um, I want to sort of try and paint a picture for you what it was like um, in that scene, in that place. So first of all, we're talking about Passover, six days before Passover, a significant Jewish festival. Now, the time of year, though, was spring. So if you're um, in Israel in spring, you're talking warm days, not blisteringly hot, but pretty warm, probably hot for this country, I guess. And then <clears throat> in the evenings, it would be nice and cool. So you've got that contrast. Just imagine a Mediterranean holiday type of thing. And where they are, they're in Bethany. So this is a village. It's um, outside Jerusalem. It's about, in those days, it may have taken them the best part of a day to walk from Jerusalem to Bethany. But we're talking within a, a day's walk of Jerusalem. And they would have been in a village with, um, we're talking sort of stone-built houses, sort of that square type you sort of imagine with the sort of whitewashed walls. That's the kind of thing they would have been in. And it was Lazarus's home. Now, Lazarus, um, we read in John's Gospel a couple of chapters before about how Lazarus had got sick and died. And... Um, Mary and Martha had gone to Jesus and said, help us, help us. And when, by the time Jesus had got there, Lazarus had died. But Jesus raised him from the dead. So it's a significant place they are. And they're at dinner. <clears throat> so dinner means it's probably the evening. Imagine you're in the house. Um, there's lights, candles lit up because it's dark. And it's in the... In the Temperature has just cooled down. And there's a long table, because it actually says, you know, it wasn't just Mary, Martha and Lazarus and Jesus. This would have been a village affair. This would have been a, a dinner for him, a celebratory one. And so you've got Jesus there, probably his disciples. We mentioned one of them later on, but I'm sure the others were there. And, and the people of the village would have been there, significant people. And Lazarus was there. And they're all sitting around, maybe having... Uh, Typical food might have been uh, stews or breads, olives, that sort of Mediterranean diet. Just imagine being there or as a, maybe as a spectator and there's chatter going on round the room, different people talking to each other. Mary is, oh sorry, Martha is going round and serving one of those serving people there. And into this situation, Mary comes and she kneels down at Jesus' feet and she breaks open some perfume, pure nard. Now, I actually uh, got hold of some nard. It still exists. This is a, a little bottle of pure nard. It's also known as spiked nard and it's made from the flowers that come from usually the Himalayan region, from India. And so it was an import of it. This is one I, you can actually get it off Amazon these days. Um, and this, you know, these days, okay, it costs uh, about um, eight, nine pounds for a little bottle like this. Um, but in those days, it would have cost a year's workers, sort of a, a laborer's salary to buy the amount that Mary had. It was more like the size of a, a can of Coke or something like that. It was in a, um, and it was there in a little flask and she broke it open. Now this stuff is quite powerful. Now, unfortunately, um, I had COVID back in November and I don't have a very good sense of smell. So I, the other day, took it, got received it, went big breath in. And um, unfortunately for me, 
I can only smell it just a touch. I just sort of know it's there. So I, I went to my wife and said, oh, is it just me or, or can I not smell this? You know, you have a smell. She put under and took a big breath like that. She was like, oh man, this is a really powerful perfume. And it's not just a, a smell here wafted it under your nose. She took a flask and she broke it open. And so it would have poured everywhere. It would have gone over his feet. It would have been there um, around. And into this room, which had meal being served, people chattering and, and food, things like that, this perfume would have filled the whole room, overwhelmed it, had this sense. It would have been the only thing going on in the room. It massively drew attention to what was going on. And all heads must have turned and looked at what was going on. And... Mary then pours it over his feet and then wipes it with her hair. This is a staggering thing for her to do. Feet are the place of, um, of the real lowest of the low servants because the feet would have been dirty. This is the end of the day, having walked in sandals around in the heat and the sweat. And she uses her hair. That would have been seen. Women didn't have their hair down. They wouldn't have been allowed around, around others. And she lets it down and wipes his feet with her hair. It was a staggering thing for her to do. And so, let's put that down. In contrast, though, in one corner of the room, maybe, is, is Judas. And he says... Why was this perfume not sold for, for all the money? 300 denarii. We could have given that money to the poor. You think, that's a, that's a fairly good point, actually. I mean, Jesus had a heart for the poor, a real heart for the poor. So why didn't Jesus condemn what Mary had done? In fact, Jesus rebukes Judas here. And not re rebuking the suggestion that money should be given to the poor. Absolutely not. But Judas's thinking was twisted. Judas was thinking about himself, what he could gain from the situation. It wasn't about the poor. It was about him. And so in this situation, surrounded by all these other people as well, and Jesus in the middle, you have on one side... You have Mary, extravagant, irreverently so in some ways. And then on the other, you have this selfishness, this self-seeking. One of them is all about Jesus. Mary is looking into Jesus. She's serving him. It's all about him. And the other, Judas, is thinking about himself. It's a worldly perspective he's taken. Mary loved Jesus with a passion. Why wouldn't she have? She had turned to Jesus in her hour of need when her uh, Lazarus had died or was dramatically sick as she, uh, at that time. And she'd gone to him and said, I believe you are the Messiah. I believe you can save him. And he did. So Mary had a passion, a devotion to Jesus. She had, he, he had saved Lazarus. And Lazarus is sitting there now. So she was overwhelmed with love for him. He was her saviour. He was her messiah. What I wonder, though, in this situation is... What would I have done? I want to be more like Mary. But sometimes I think I may be more like Judas. I know that's a bit of a shocking thing to say, but think of it like this. I, I mean, I'm a bit of a rule keeper. I want things to be done properly. I, I don't like waste and things like that. And I think there is in each of us we can sometimes see and identify with being a bit like Judas in this situation. We can get caught up with perspectives 
um, views on things that are based on our own desires or based on worldly ones. And we miss the point. We're in the room with Jesus, but we're not looking towards him. It's interesting in my perspective how so often money comes into this it did for judas and whether it's actually money or worldly perspectives which is often so much about money isn't it our jobs about money and our houses about money what we do in our activities our money and where we put it tells so much about where our heart is and the bible says that i was um reflecting on this um about where priorities are because um, earlier in the week I attended a um, PCC meeting. This is a sort of a, a group who help run the parish um, and make decisions about it. And at the moment, the PCC is talking and thinking about its priorities for the next five years. And that is to a great deal, um, a great extent, about where we spend our money what or even our resources our our physical effort and all that where do we direct it to and i found it interesting that um on the one hand we had um a big group of things of practical things that just need sorting out particularly around buildings things to stop things falling down to keep things in good condition but if you're not careful our buildings, our way we do services, the way we live our Christian life can sometimes start to look and be about us. And then what happens to the ministry? What happens towards looking towards Jesus in that situation? Our purpose is to become a Christ-like community for ourselves and for those we look to reach out to. Actually, I was very pleased with the outcome of the discussions on this week, um, on Wednesday. Um, we ended up with a list of ministry priorities, those things that are actually going to reach out to others, that are actually going to point to Jesus in our lives, going to transform us. But at the same time, we didn't forget the other stuff. No, they are now considered, um, we talked about them being enabling priorities. They are things now that we have to get done if we are to do with the other stuff. Which means even that building stuff, even all those practical stuff, are now pointing to Jesus. Because there was nothing wrong with the buildings, as long as we just didn't consider them in themselves. It's all about pointing to Jesus. So now we have ministry priorities pointing to Jesus and we have enabling priorities pointing to Jesus. Before, unless we enable them, it's unless it's enabling our service to Jesus, our pointing towards him, um, we've got it wrong. And we start to be a bit more like Judas, thinking about what we can gain, what's in it for us. And I want to give you another example. That's a church example, but I want to think about, uh, I'm going to tell you about something in my life. So um, in my company, in the last couple of weeks, one thing they've done is um, they've got some tough times um, with their budgets. And so what they said is, actually, we're going to offer something called voluntary severance. And that is, if you want to leave the company right here, right now, um, you can sign up. And if we agree, we will give you money. We will give you money to leave, extra money. And gosh, that got a lot of people thinking hard. Do I want to stay? What do I want to go? And and for me personally, I I considered it and looked at it very seriously. But I found it really hard to involve God in that situation. Because as I thought it through and all the, well, what about this? What about that? It all became about risk. You know, what's the risk? If I'd, what happens if I don't get a job after several months when the money runs out? What, how much savings have we got? Um, cash flow. Uh, what do we spend our money on? Oh, what are our timelines of this going to be? How would I get a new job? Will it affect our standards of living? It suddenly became about me. And that's very hard to bring God into that situation sometimes. 
And when we make any decisions for our lives, big or small, it becomes very hard. I prayed even for God to help me make the right decision. But the danger of that is I just say, God, will you help me out making the choices about how I'm going, what I'm going to spend money on, live on, and um, all those things. But maybe I should have gone further in my prayers. I didn't pray, what would give you glory? What would point this situation towards you? I didn't question, what do you want me to do right now? Forget me. What do you want? And... I didn't ask, how should I respond to this situation in my life in response to what Jesus has done for me in my life? The relationship I have with him, because I can be in relationship because of what he's done for me. The price Jesus paid for me on the cross. For all those times, I've actually been looking in the other direction, done the wrong thing. He died on the cross for me so that those could be forgiven, so that I can be in relationship. So how do I look at the choices in my life and the things I do? How do we all do that to make sure that we focus on Jesus? That he's in the room, that we're looking towards him, that we're addressing our life and putting it before him. Our lives become a, an offering to him, poured out like the nard. I want to be more like Mary, but sometimes I'm still a bit like Judas. And so it's important we spend time in our lives, deliberate time, refocusing on God. The time when we spend with him, when we're praying with him, when we're just discussing our lives, but trying to do it in the context of him, not just as a helper for us um, to come in and save us in sort of a, the little struggles we have in our life, but actually involve him, be in relationship, get to know him. When we remember his sacrifice, it can draw us closer to him and help us orientate ourselves, point to Jesus. And we do that when we come to communion. We remember what he did, his body and his blood um, given for us. And as we approach Easter now, we again, we have this particular time of year where we look to the cross and what Jesus did on the cross for us. And those are the times in particular we can just, yeah, try and be orientated towards him and we can say to him I want to be more like Mary Lord make me a bit more like Mary I want to be more like Mary Lord help me today in this moment be a bit more like Mary Amen Let's worship together now as Anna leads us. i 
pray together now as Richard leads us. The response to Lord in your mercy is hear our prayer. Lord in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, creator of life and joy, we give you thanks and praise for the gift of eternal life through the death and resurrection of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. We delight in you and your never-ending passion for all people. We give you thanks and praise for the people who have helped us to grow in the faith, the preachers, the teachers, the shining examples, our friends and relatives, Bless all who seek to bring others to you. All who show your love for the world in their goodness. We pray that we may become a contemplative, compassionate and courageous church. For Anna and our work with children and families. Are we inspired? and our work in schools, all involved in our home groups and those among us who serve in our community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks for those people who put themselves in harm's way to bring us open and full reports 
from where there is conflict, so that we are brought face to face with grim realities without being affected directly. We pray for all who are involved in the war in Ukraine, the military and the civilians caught up in the fighting, the refugees and all who seek to help those who are traumatised and fleeing for their lives. Lord, we ask you to bring justice, healing and salvation where there is overwhelming pain and agony. We pray for all those who have made a spontaneous personal response, collecting and delivering aid directly. May our government be as generous and welcoming as our people, acting with the urgency that the situation demands. May we all continue to be as generous as we can in the face of such enormous need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks and praise for the people who give their time and energy to serve our community in so many varied ways. Often swamped by the demands placed on them, your love shines through them in patience, kindness and perseverance. Give us grace to be of service to our community in familiar ways and in ways that you have yet to show us. We pray for those organisations who depend on volunteers to do their work and for the reopening of the Three Seas Café. Give us a passion for service and turn us into the Christ-like people that you would have us be. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks and praise for those people who minister as carers, nurses and medics, to people who are infirm, ill, in pain or in trouble. May we join them in that ministry as we remember those for whom our prayers have been asked and those who we know and call to mind now. Grant them recovery and restoration, and where that is not possible, consolation and freedom from suffering. Take us out of our comfort zones to give comfort to those in need, to ease their plight. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks and praise for all who have gone before and now have their rest in your love. We remember those who have died recently. And whose anniversaries are at this time. By your passion, grant them eternal rest, and may your perpetual light shine upon them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Amen. The Collect for today. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, 
Grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May God, our Redeemer, show us compassion and love. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. That concludes our service for this morning. Thank you for joining with me and worshipping with me. Next week is Palm Sunday at St John's. Our 9.30 service will be an all-age worship service. And then in the afternoon we have our second messy church at the Weller Centre. The first one went really well. We had 22 children with their parents or carers. Uh, we're hoping for even more this time. And if you would like to be part of Messy Church, do message Anna on anna at ctmparish.org.uk. And particularly, if you could come at six o'clock to help us clear up when the rest of the team are quite tired at that point and tables need shifting, uh, we would be really grateful if you could come and shift tables or wash up, uh, do message Anna. That's all for this week. I'll be here again next Sunday, same time. Hope to see you then. Have a great week. Bye for now.